Church of Christ, we're glad that you're here this morning and that uh, you have chosen to worship with us. I've chosen for us to uh, open up with with Scripture, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And all over the, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. sing all three verses of that also.
Good to see each of you here this morning. At this time, we come to offer our prayers for those that are sick and those that are in need. But uh, first of all, uh, a bit of good news. I understand that uh, today is James and Francis's 57th wedding anniversary, 57 years. That's just truly awesome. In this day and time, it's, it's beyond awesome. So, happy anniversary. Are there any names you need to mention this morning? Francis Robertson and Joey Hanks. Uh, keep both of those families in your prayers. Uh, that Francis Robinson is uh, JL's sister, and she lived in Danville. And uh, Joy, Joy Hanks, uh, many of you know Eddie Hanks here in town. It was his mother that passed away this week. So please keep both those families in your prayers. Are there any other names you need to mention? Yeah, someone to sit with Louis, Nancy, and Cooper, and the, the whole Melton family. Just keep, just keep all of them in your prayers. Uh, any other names you need to mention this morning? 64 years wedding anniversary. James, y'all going to have to hurry up and catch up. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, 64 years. That's J.L. and Delana. Any other names need to mention? Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for the day you've given us. And Father, we come to this time, we offer our prayers for those that are sick, those that are in need, and family, uh, families that lost loved ones. Father, we know that there are many that are sick. We know that many that are hurting. Father, we just pray that you be with each name that we mentioned this morning. Be with the individuals, the families, and the situations. And we just pray your blessings be upon them. And Father God, we just thank you for the marriage vows, James and Francis, J.L. and Delena, with their long and happy marriages. Father, we just ask you to bless them and keep them, Father. Father, we know that it is a rough time here in this nation right now, and we just ask you to be with this nation and be with the leadership of this nation, this state, this county, and all this church. Father, we just pray you'll lead and guide us in the way that you want us to go. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to our time of communion, uh, we're going to be singing moment by moment, which is number 351, and we'll be doing the first and the last verses.
across uh, this devotion in the uh, Christian standard uh, that I thought was kind of thought-provoking, at least for me, and, and I hope it will be uh, for you. Uh, he starts off by saying, in his description of Good Friday, Matthew shared details about three events that corresponded with the time of Jesus' death. And then he quotes uh, two passages, uh, Matthew chapter 27, that talks about uh, the, those events uh, specifically. Uh, in Matthew 27, verses 51 through 53, Matthew records, at that moment, at that moment of Christ's death, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Um, he asked the question, uh, Stuart Powell, by the way, is the author of this, this meditation. He asked the question, why do we spend so little time pondering these three great acts of God? The torn curtain, the earthquake, and the resurrection from the tombs. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22, goes into a little more uh, description uh, and and uh, uh, of this image of the curtain being torn. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And then he asked the questions, do you recall any lessons? Have you ever had a Sunday school lesson or, or a Wednesday night lesson on the many resurrection that accompanied Jesus' death? That's not something that we talk a lot about, even though it's recorded in scripture, it's not something that, that we think about too much, but that was a spectacular event. And what about the timing of the earthquake? What does God want Christians to see in these unusual events? And then he says, perhaps in the moment of Jesus' death on the cross, God provided a reminder of the powerful work of, the, of life that his son accomplished a work so potent that it shook all of creation. It began by reversing the impact that sin had on physical, social, and spiritual connections. Perhaps Jesus' death unleashed an explosion of life that impacted some in the nearby graves. If the death of Jesus transformed part of Jerusalem on Good Friday... Imagine what will happen to the world when Jesus comes again. At this time of communion, I want us to take time to ponder the full spectrum of the work that God accomplished at Golgotha. We eat the bread to remember that Jesus gave up his body for us. And we drink from the cup to remember that life has, was restored in us through his blood poured out on that hill called Golgotha. Let us celebrate today with grace. Let us contemplate his great power and let us look forward to his return. Would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for this day that you have given us the opportunity to come into your house and to worship you, but more specifically to come around your table and to remember the great sacrifice that was made and the impact that, that his death so many years ago had upon the immediate surroundings of Jerusalem, but even more so the impact that his death and resurrection has had all around the world and will have an even, even greater impact when he comes again the second time. 
Father, as we partake of these emblems today, may we just take the time to reflect both upon the sacrifice that Jesus made as well as the life that we live for him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. And whenever we drink this bread and eat this, or eat, eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's stand uh, for our doxology at this time, and then I'm going to ask Roy if he would lead us in prayer. Father our God, we thank Thee for the time we have to come and worship Thee. We thank Thee for the many blessings of life. We just ask a special blessing on this service. Lead and guide us in everything we say and do. We always give you the praise. In Christ's name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through uh, 12 this morning as we continue our series and an encouraging word. Uh, and I have entitled this message, Living Distinctive Lives. Um, one of the commentaries that I read this week suggested uh, a good title for this passage uh, to be, uh, How Then Shall We Live? And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is encouraging us. Uh, uh, how we ought to live our, our Christian life. How, how are we to live out our lives as we await the return of, of Jesus Christ? Um, the way that we live our life will either, one of two things, either help or hinder our ability to reach out to the lost world that does not know Jesus Christ. The Bible says that as Christians... You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. In our society, we do not want anybody telling us uh, how we uh, should live our lives. We don't want anyone, including God, to tell us even how... Uh, to worship. You remember that, that country song a number of years ago? Uh, I think it was George Jones that said, me and Jesus has got our own thing going. Uh, you know, and, and that's the way a lot of people in, in, in the world think today. Don't tell me how to, to worship. Don't, don't, don't preach to me. Me and Jesus, <laughs> we've got our own thing going. Well, I, I've listened to a lot of those ways that, that, that people uh, think, and it, it sure doesn't go along with what the Bible says. They certainly must have their own thing going on with, with God and with Jesus. But, but the Bible tells us very clearly that if we are indeed followers of Jesus Christ, and if we are really indeed going to have a positive impact upon the world, we have to be willing to live distinctive, different, uh, maybe even uh, crazy in some people's eyes kind of life. As we look at our text today, I, I want us to see uh, that, that Paul actually is really affirming or encouraging 
uh, to his readers. He tells them, in fact, that they are doing a great job living their lives for Jesus Christ, but he wants to encourage them to strive to continue in their growth. The time in which we reach a point where we think, man, we, 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 we are, we've got it all together. You know, we're, we're living the perfect life. Uh, we have become stagnant. And that's why Paul is telling the Thessalonian church, don't be satisfied with where you are. Continue in your growth. It can be so easy for us to, to live a God-pleasing life on Sunday but then, every other day of the week, when we go to our homes or to our work or, or to our school or our places of, of, of recreation, uh, it can be so difficult. Satan has lulled a lot of people into thinking that the way that they live has no impact uh, on, on their spirituality. It has no impact upon how they influence other people. But indeed, it does. Um, a lot of people uh, have the attitude, well, I, I have the right to, to live my life as I please. Um, but as Christians, that's not really true. Um, we need to remember that if we gave our life to Jesus Christ, if we have given our life to Jesus Christ, then it was our choice to change the way that we live. It was our choice to live for him because he died for us. Um, you know, if we haven't done that, or if we're complaining about how strict or stringent the Christian life can be sometimes, it, it, it's kind of like you know somebody renouncing their citizenship of one country and moving to another country and then complaining that their new country is not like their old country. <laughs> but a lot of people do that, don't they? Uh, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are saying this world is not our home. We are only passing through. We, we are citizens of heaven. When we give our life to Jesus Christ, that's when our life truly begins. And so this morning, I, I want us to uh, uh, see what kind of life that Jesus encourages and expects those of us who call ourselves Christians to live by. We are called, first of all, to live a life of submission. The first thing as Christians that we do is we submit our life to Jesus Christ. Now this is important for us to remember because everything else that we do in our lives flows from this submissive spirit to Jesus. Um, at, at what point, we have to ask ourselves, at what point will we cease to be submissive to God? What point will we stop growing and maturing? What is it that if God called you to do today, would you refuse to do? You say, oh, there's nothing. Really? Really? You remember the story of Jonah? I mean, Jonah was a man of God. He was a man of great faith. And God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and, 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 and preach a revival to people to repent, turn their life to God. And if, and if they don't repent and turn their life to God, God's going to destroy the entire city and all the people. Did Jonah want to go? Did Jonah refuse to go? <laughs> yes, he did. Now, God persuaded him to eventually do it, but he, he didn't want to even after he went. And so I ask again, what is it that if God called you to do today, 
would you refuse to do it? The Bible says that we are to have a submissive spirit. Now, God's not going to call us to do something that's going to be against his word. Please remember that. If, if you feel like that you are called to do something that, that goes against the Bible, then maybe you're hearing the voice of somebody else and not God. But God is calling us as Christians to go and make disciples of all the nations, just like Jonah was called to, to go and, and preach repentance, a revival to the people of Nineveh. Are we doing it? Are we doing it? Or are we like Jonah going in the opposite direction? And the only thing that's, that's going to change our, our, our heart and change our, our minds is if we get swallowed up by a great fish and spewed out on to dry land somewhere after three days. What, what's going to change our mind? What's going to change our heart to have that submissive kind of heart? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul writes to the, to the Thessalonians. In the New International Version, it says, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. Now, as I read the different translations of that verse, I, I discovered that the that, that a lot of the other translations was a lot longer than the NIV. And, and so I began to do a little bit of research and, and found that uh, the New American Standard uh, actually is a pretty good literal translation of the original Greek uh, text there that says, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and to please God, just as exactly actually you do walk, that you may excel still more. I like that, especially that last phrase, that you may excel still more. Now let's go back and, and, and pick out a couple of words in in the New American Standard uh, translation, the, the actual more literal translation, uh, what notice the word ought. You ought. Uh, how you ought to walk and to please God. That word ought means obligation. As Christians, we have an obligation. We ought <laughs> to walk and live to please God. Paul is gently reminding the Thessalonians and us that we are to walk with God. We're not just to talk the talk. We are to walk the walk. We are to live in such a way that is pleasing to God. And then also notice the word request. The word request there denotes a suggestion among equals. Now, why do I point that out? Paul is not trying to use his apostolic authority to make his readers to do anything. He, 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 he is saying we are on equal ground here. We are on equal footing. As we have often said, the, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Uh, it's, it's, it's a reminder that we're, we're equals. And so uh, there's a suggestion there that we do this together. And, and then notice the word exhort. That word exhort means to earnestly and vigorously encourage. When was the last time that we earnestly and vigorously encouraged one another? It, it means to come alongside of. Last week, I think it was that I talked about uh, paraclete. And the word paraclete means to come alongside of. 
And we talk about a lot of parachurch organizations that we support as, as missions. Um, you know, we, we do that all the time. Um, and uh, we are to be paraclete uh, of one another as well. We are to come alongside of and lift up and, and encourage. Paul is reminding us that to live for God is the Christian's motive for encouraging one another and to live rightly for God, to, to be in submission uh, toward one another. And when we come alongside of one another and encourage one another, we are being submissive together. You know, when we look at these 12 verses that, that we're looking at today, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, uh, there is something that really ought to jump out uh, at us that, that should just absolutely jump off the page because Paul is telling his readers here in these 12 verses that we ought, ought to walk to please God, but not because he tells us so, but because God tells us so. How many times have you heard somebody say, who are you to tell someone how they ought to live their life? Who, who are you uh, to uh, tell someone that uh, what they can't or, or cannot do with their own bodies? Who are you to tell someone that their lifestyle is a wrong choice of a lifestyle? Now, before we go on to my other points uh, in this text, uh, I, I, I just want us to to kind of glance down uh, at these, these verses. Uh, because just in these 12 verses, look how many references there are to the authority of God. Paul is not exacting his authority. He's telling us that this authority in which he's writing these things come from God. Notice in verse 1, Paul talks about living in order to please God. In verse 2, he says these instructions come by the authority of the Lord Jesus. In verse 3, he says obedience to these commands is God's will. In verse 6, he says that the Lord will punish those who choose to live a life of sin. In verse 7, he says that God has called us to live a holy life. In verse 8, he says that those who reject these instructions does not reject a man, but God. How many times have you ever heard someone say, well, you're not arguing with me, you're arguing with God when we argue something about Scripture. Uh, if the Scripture says that we're not arguing with one another, we're, we're arguing with God. And then notice in verse 9, he says that we are taught by God to love one another. Paul makes it clear that it's not his authority that he's talking about submission. It's God's authority. Um, God alone has the authority and the right to dictate what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in his sight. If I try to make up my own rules, if I say me and Jesus has got our own thing going, I'm not living a submissive life to God. I'm living the way I want to live. I, I'm not being a, a creature made in the image of God. I am trying to make God into a creature in my image. We are called to submit to the authority of God and his authority only. Secondly, I want us to notice that we are called to live a life of purity. Also, not only a life of submission, but a life of purity. However, I think that if we are living a life of submission, we also are going to be living a life of purity. But Paul says it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Notice there in verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. And in verses 3 through 7, he goes on to give the boundaries of Christian sexual behavior. And uh, he also gives the reason uh, for these boundaries. Now, what does it mean to be sanctified? 
Well, sanctified simply means to be made holy, to be set aside for a special service to God, to be treated as holy. If we are a Christian, then we belong to God, and it is God's will that we be set aside for his service. You know, I'm, I'm greatly troubled when I hear the things that, you know, in, in our society, e even among Christians, uh, when, when they say that, you know, uh, people really can't control themselves. People really can't think for themselves. We're, we're like, you know, the animal kingdom. Um, well, if, if we really belong to Jesus, uh, then we are a special, unique, and different kind of people. We have been called then to do special, unique, and different kinds of things. You know, it, it, it's okay with me. I, I, I don't know about you. It, it's okay with me if the world uh, says certain things are okay and, 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 and you can do whatever you want to do. But I'm not okay when Christians say that. You know, if, if you want to live the lifestyle that you want to live, then don't use the Bible to try to condone it. You know, uh, don't, don't, don't say that certain things are okay if the Bible says that it's not okay or vice versa. But it, even at that, it shouldn't surprise us because the Bible says there's going to come a time when the people of this world are going to call bad things good and good things bad. Uh, so we shouldn't be surprised. But as Christians, I am surprised when I hear those things. And, 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 it, and it really troubles me uh, that, uh, that, that people do that, especially Christian people. Because we belong to God, we are called to resist the temptation to fall prey to inappropriate, alternative kinds of lifestyles. We are called to exercise discipline and, and faithfulness uh, to God because participation in impurity puts us outside of God's will. We are told that it is God's will that we abstain from sexual immorality. And, and I don't think that I need to stand up here this morning and go into great detail of what sexual immorality means. We, we are hit with so many images on television and billboards and, and just about anywhere else that you can think of that, that it makes us hard to in our in our in our minds and and in our lives to really maintain a a pure mind, but when we fall prey uh, to whatever kind of immorality uh, that the world wants to throw at us, we hurt ourselves as Christians and we hurt the work that God has laid out for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 says, Just as he who called you is holy, so you are to be holy. Purity depends in part upon our own self-control. Uh, look at verses 4 and 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, Each of you should learn to control his own body, in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate and lust like the heathen uh, who do not know God. Again, you know, the world's going to have their way of, of, of living. Um, but as Christians, we're different. We're distinctive. We're set apart. We are sanctified. And we should not, as the church or <laughs> as individual Christians, condone uh, alternate lifestyles. We are to control our bodies and we are to condemn that kind of life. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, is verse 18 through 20 says, 
flee sexual immorality. All other sin a man commits are outside of his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. The passion of lust is powerful. But falling prey betrays what God calls us to be here for. And that is to be his ambassadors, to be his servants, to be the ones who spread his word. Romans chapter 6 verse 19 says, I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Ah, we ought to be slaves to the righteousness of God. Thirdly, we are called to live a life of love. Um, some might say, you know, Kemp, what, what you've been saying doesn't sound very loving. Well, my response is, which is more loving? To let somebody go on living a life that, that is sinful and wind up in hell? Or to proclaim the truth of God's word and they turn their life around and they give their life to God and they get to go to heaven someday. Uh, to me, it's much more loving to rebuke someone, to rebuke a certain lifestyle and, and change people's hearts than it is to go on and let them do whatever they want to do and they wind up losing their soul. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet he forfeits his soul, the scripture says. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 10 says, About brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. Did you catch that? For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love. <laughs> that better be Jesus calling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Paul says it is God himself that teaches us to love one another. And indeed he does. In John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35, Jesus said, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And in 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 17, the apostle John writes there, and so we know and rely on the love that God has for, for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love uh, uh, lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. And then in verses 19 through 21 of 1 John chapter 4, uh, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must love one another. Um, I often wonder, where is the grace that the church has been called to extend to one another? Where is the grace that we are supposed to show our brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling? Do we just continue to to let them go down the road that they are going? Or do we show them love and try to pull them back on the straight and narrow? That's what the Bible tells us to do. If we see our brother in sin, we are to, to go to them. Uh, we are to, to help them. Um, 
We're not to kick them while they're down. Uh, we're not to kick them out to the curb. Uh, we, we are first to go to them and talk to them and, and try to lead them back on the right track. Now, there is a point where we, the Bible does say, turn them over to Satan so that their souls might be saved. But we don't wish them harm. We don't talk behind their back. We don't get snippy with them and snarky with them. And we, we, uh, we love them. Uh, the way that God loved us, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, the Bible says that God did not come send his son into the world to condemn the world because the world's already stood condemned. But he sent his son into the world so that the world might be saved. That should be our goal as well in love, showing love to one another in order to win their souls to Jesus Christ. We are to love one another in both word and in deed. Uh, we are to practice it. We're not just to, to preach it. We, we are to put it into practice as well. And, and we are never to stop this practice of love. Verse 10 says, in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. And here it is again. Yet we urge you to do so more and more. Uh, don't grow stagnant. Don't, don't just stop at a certain point. Go the extra mile. What was that saying uh, that we saw? The, the path... Uh, the, the, the path, the second mile of the path is the loneliest. <laughs> Something like that. I, I can't remember exactly. But, but how true that is. The second mile of the path is the loneliest mile because not too many people is willing to go the second mile. And that leads us to the, to the final uh, thing this morning. We are called to live a life in community with one another. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 continues, Make it your ambition to lead the quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Uh, we are to live a life that does not cause unnecessary disturbance uh, or conflict with our neighbors. Now, sometimes the very act of sharing the gospel seems to go contrary to this. Um, but uh, what, what we are to do, though, is present the word of God with love. Speak the truth in love. I, I think the Apostle Paul's words to the Romans in chapter 12 uh, verses 9 through 21 explains and expands upon this more than I could myself. And so let me just read it. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil, anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you heap burning coals upon his head. 
Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 7 says, When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes his enemies even live at peace with him. I like that. When we live at peace, uh, when we live a life that is pleasing to God, uh, it makes even our enemies live at peace with us. In closing, let me just say, we are a special people as Christians. We have been called to a special purpose, the purpose of serving the creator of heaven and earth the one who loved us so much, we are called to serve him uh, because he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die so that we can have eternal life. God has called us and commanded us to live the sanctified life, the pure life, a holy life, a life that, that stands out unique and different. And when people look at us, they'll want to say, I I, I want some of what they have. Uh, But in order to do that, we have to be submissive. Let me share this final story. After a violent storm one night, a large tree, which over the years had become stately and giant, was found lying across the pathway in a park. Nothing but a splintered stump was left. Upon closer examination, it showed that it was rotten at the core because thousands of tiny insects had eaten away at its heart. The weakness of the tree was not brought upon by a sudden storm. It began the very moment that the first insect nestled within its, within its bark. With the Holy Spirit's help, we can guard our life's purity. Every bit of our immorality, uh, every bit of immorality that we allow in our lives is like allowing one of those insects to come inside of our own bodies and to begin eating away at our heart until eventually we just rot away from the inside out. And so the question that I put before us as we prepare for our invitation is are you allowing the insects to eat away at your core? If you're doing that, the only cleansing element is Jesus Christ. He came to die in your place, to give you the hope of eternal life. If you have not surrendered to him, if you have not become obedient to him, if you have not become submissive to him, this invitation is for you. I need thee every hour. We're going to stand and we're going to sing the first and the last verses. If you have a decision to make for him, meet me down here in the front.
Thank you for being here and worshiping with us. I'm going to ask JC if he would close us in prayer, and then we'll have our scripture blessing. Father, which are in heaven, once more we come to thee as humble as we know how. <coughs> Father, we give thanks for this another day that thou have given us, and especially another Lord's Day when we meet together as part of the family to worship thee and offer up our praises and our prayers, Father, for our people that is gathered here and for those that are not here. We pray for each one. We pray for our nation, Father, all the things that we are facing and the turmoils that we see taking place. We pray that some way, somehow, that thy healing hand might touch all of it and make it whole again. We pray as we go forth in this day and this week that we might be led and guided by thy Holy Spirit that we might walk in a way that be pleasing to thee. And most of all, always really realizing that uh, we're told in thy word that all scripture is breathed through God, Father, and it's what he knew that we needed to conduct our lives and to direct, to direct our ways in a way that we need to walk. Bless each one as we go forth and forgive us, we pray, for we fall so short so many times. And we pray, Father, that thy guidance might be with each and every one and keep us in thy grace. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great week.